Hello everyone. The Nida Fellowship Center is delighted to host this webinar and I'm pleased to extend a warm welcome to you all to this the third water webinar that DFC is launching this year. I'm Arvid Slot, Capacity Development Advisor at the Nida Fellowship Center. This water webinar is live streamed via the Nida Fellowship Center's channels on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter X. The overall topic of, of today is flood management, early warning system and the use of real-time data. A subject that under climate change indeed is growing in importance and relevance for many countries. We will particularly explore the importance of timely data availability and also the application of warning technologies for data scarce areas. Today, we have three great presenters. They are Dr. Nicola uh, Balbarini, water resource engineer at DHI, and Dr. Alexander Murray, environmental engineer at DHI, and finally, Laura Kumau, senior water resource expert at DHI. A more detailed introduction to each presenter will follow as we proceed. The purpose of this webinar is threefold. One, learn from expert, where experts working in the field of flood warning management systems. Two, be inspired by methodologies and new models in flood management. And finally, three, to connect with other than either fellows and water resource professionals worldwide. Now I welcome Dr. Nicola Balberini. Nicola will be our great facilitator today, and he will also be our first speaker. Wish you all a wonderful session. So over to you, Nicola. Welcome. Thank you very much, Arvid, for the introduction. As you already mentioned, my name is Nicola Balbarini. I'm a water resources expert at DHI, and I will be uh, your host today for today's webinar. Uh, before we get started and kick off the program, just a little bit of a, uh, some clarifications. Whatever the platform you're signing up from, you're very much welcome to post your comments, reflection, questions. We will have, as Arvi already mentioned, we'll start with three presentations, but at the end we will have a good amount of time to address any of your comments or remark or questions and address those to our presenters today, our experts. So please post your questions and we will make sure they are addressed. So we're now ready to kick off the program and uh, I will start with an introduction around early warning systems for flooding and what are they being used for, why are they useful, why there's been so much interest around them in the past few years, and especially how can we use real-time data in order to enhance the performance of these systems. The, um, just a little bit of a, a, a few, uh, a bit of introduction around why operational forecasting system has become so um, uh, hyped or, or of interest in the last few years. Um, there has been an increased risk uh, around the issues related to flooding. This is linked to several factors. One of them, and I'm sure many of you have already heard about it before, is climate change. This is making, this is um, enhancing, worsening the, some of the causes, some of the risks that are related to flooding. Urbanization is also a key driver. And the reason here is that areas that were prone to flooding in the past few years were maybe not as urbanized as they are right now. And this, of course, increased the risk of flooding, increased the risk of damages to the houses and the people that are living in this area. Of course, infrastructure, human lives is, is a big focus and, and protecting these, ensuring protection of those is important. And finally, uh, there is an increased demand around control and mitigation of floods. And in all these aspects, flood early warning system, flood forecasting can play a, an important role. So when we're talking about flood early warning system, what, what are they actually, what, what are we talking about? What, what is this technology? 
There are several aspects that goes into this uh, technology. First of all, we have, of course, data. So information around how the situation is right now, how it's been in the past, and how it's expected to change in the, in the next coming days, months. And here, of course, meteorological forecast, which we're probably all familiar with, plays an important role. Then the second step in flood early warning system is, of course, to once we have information around what is happening, is also to understand how things might change. And here, uh, basin river modeling is the underlying technology uh, in order to understand, predict what is going on in the system. And all these informations, together with the prediction, can then be compiled to know what is going to happen, set up some actions in order to prevent some of the damages, uh, mitigate them, and uh, of course also issue warnings in case the population, in case uh, stakeholders need to be informed in order to set into place alleviation measures. What are some of the key data that are needed in order for, for, for our early warning system? As Arvid mentioned before, one of the key topics of today is also to understand how real-time data uh, play actually an important role in making this system more reliable and useful. And there is a broad set of data that can actually be used in these kind of uh, um, information systems. Knowing what happens in the short term, so how things are going to change in the next few hours through, for example, weather uh, radar, that's uh, uh, one of the key uh, one of the key technology. But we can also, for example, incorporate um, short range and medium range uh, forecast and predictions, weather predictions. Uh, and finally, also on the longer term, the seasonal long term forecast can also play an important role. When I talk about seasonal uh, long term forecast, um, this is of course mainly relevant in the in the uh, in areas prone to not so much flooding but more drought and food security. These are some of the topics that use this kind of information. No worries if you are a bit wondering exactly what are these data about this forecast. The presentation after mine will will actually go in detail and show some of the example from the site. So you will have a good time to kind of familiarize with these uh, with these kind of data sets. And finally. Before we, we move on to the next presentation, I just want to highlight some of the benefits uh, of using operational flood forecasting and control systems. So, as I mentioned before, there are several um, reasons why they're becoming of, of uh, increased relevance. Um, just to highlight some of the benefits, the uh, improving preparedness, uh, so being ready to act as soon as possible, this is really one of the key advantage of flood forecasting. Um, so being able to implement better mitigation measures and in this way reduce the damage, reduce the cost uh, that are linked to flooding events, which in many cases are unavoidable. Uh, well, the event is unavoidable, not the damage and the cost that it can cause. Um, when um, is of course also important when dealing with, with uh, river basin management, management of these infrastructures, are, is really important to understand what the situation is and how the situation is changing. And here again, the, the real-time flood uh, early warning system can flood forecasting can really play a role here. So understand how the situation is, how it's changing over time. And uh, another final important role of this kind of system is of course sharing information. So being able to inform and uh, um, keep updated stakeholders, authorities, which are those who are responsible for uh, then setting into place plans for uh, mitigation plans and of course also informing uh, public, the population, that can then react uh, on time as has been uh, according to the plan. Yes, this is what I have as a first kind of like introduction. As I mentioned, there will be a couple of presentations more now going more details about different aspects of flood early warning system. And to start with this, I would like first to invite the first speaker, which is uh, her name is Alexandra uh, Moray. And uh, she's an expert in mathematical modeling, biogeochemistry and hydrology at DHI International Development Department and at the UNEP DHI Center. And in the past few years, she has been uh, driving research and development of global hydrologic systems um, and their application for risk and early warning um, uh, systems in uh, at DHI 
and um, she will present how this novel technology can actually contribute to the effort that has been made that is being uh, uh, done around flood early warning system over to you alex thank you very much for that introduction nicola um i will share the presentation here yes um so as as nicola said i'm alex murray and i'll be presenting today about novel technologies for data scarce areas with a focus on global hydrological models um as nicola said this has been an area of research for me in the past couple of years and i'd like to share what it is that I have learned with you today. So a bit of an outline for my talk. First, I'll give a brief overview of what are global hydrological models or GHMs, what can we use them for? And then I'll go into more specific details about a particular global hydrological model that's been developed by DHI. I'll end with a couple of cases where we've used it in data scarce areas and summarize before we hand off to our next speaker. So first of all, what are GHMs and, and what can we use them for? All GHMs have in common three main elements. This is the foundation of a global hydrological model. First is that they take in global data sets. Here we're mostly talking about meteorological data sets, so global weather at a, at a large scale. And then the next two elements are modeling elements where we're looking at rainfall runoff modeling and then water routing that moves the rainfall runoff results through a network system. So this at its, at its core is a global hydrological model. What we use them for is varied. There are many, many different applications. I've put a list of a few of them here. Um, one that has great focus for us is data scarce areas or using them in ungaged catchments. These will be the examples that I'll present later in the talk. We can also use them for water resource assessments, planning of water infrastructure, and when we're looking at a model at a global scale, it's, it's quite intuitive that we would also use it for large scale assessments as well. Um, and one such large scale assessment is the State of Global Water Resources Assessment that's been released by the WMO for last year, and the, the pilot was made for 2021. So this is a new series that they're working on, putting together where they can look at uh, use global hydrological models to look at the state of water resources in the world. Um, to do this, they use a suite of 11 different global hydrological models, of which DHI, GHM, the model I'll present on later, is one of them. Um, and, and this shows that there's been a, an increase in global hydrological models in the years. So the first one was from 1989, and over the past three decades, the space has really changed. The first global hydrological models were, were very academic and for research questions. And then with the advent of um, environment earth observation data sets, so increasing quality and increasing quantity of these data sets, combined with a more focus on holistic decision making, so hydrology as one aspect of making decisions, then GHMs have evolved to become a tool that we can apply uh, and this was what spurred DHI to create a global hydrological model as well. The objectives with this model were that it should be distributed hydrology at a very large scale, and it must be fast, it must be a real-time tool and complement tools that we already have. So here is a conceptual overview of DHI's global hydrological model. We can see these three main elements that I mentioned at the beginning here in these boxes. The first is global data sets, where we use topography of, of the land surface and global meteorological data to feed into the model. Then we run rainfall runoff elements um, distributed all over the world, and we route that water in the last modeling element. What we get out of this model is dis discharge in all the river points, and we can also learn about runoff and groundwater recharge at the global scale. This entire system runs hourly as new weather forecasts are released. 
when we're looking at the spatial distribution of the model, we can, we can start with an overview like this. So it does cover the entire globe from minus 60 degrees to 80 degrees. And we include these various tiles where each box on, on the globe has 10,000 models within it. Um, so that gives us a resolution of about 11 by 11 kilometers, and it yields over one and a half million distributed models over the entire globe. So this is, this is quite a large number of models, and each of these models is defined by the nine basic parameters that you can see here. Now, in a typical system, uh, when we're building this up, we would use observations from the catchment to calibrate these nine basic parameters. But with one and a half million models and areas in the world that don't have observations, we, we needed to think a little bit differently and take a different approach. So we decided to base the parameterization of the model on the physical characteristics of each of the catchments. So this is an a priori approach where we estimate what the parameters should be ahead of time. And we used various data sets, like you can see here, like land use in the catchment or depth to bedrock in order to provide a parameterization for the catchment. And the benefit with this is that we're able to provide um, parameterization for ungaged catchments as well as gauged catchments. To give an example of the resolution and the scale that we're talking about here, each of the pixels in these, in these images represents a catchment, a NAM model, and the data point that the parameter of, at that at that grid cell. Um, so 11 by 11 kilometers at the global scale is quite quite a fine resolution. When we move then from grids to the routing element, we are routing through a network um, that here were defined by the hydro sheds, basins, and caloric rivers from the World Wildlife Federation. So what we can see here is that each of these yellow catchments is an outline of a main basin. And within that catchment, um, each of these blue points represents a simulation point where we calculate the discharge running through that catchment. The routing scheme looks a little bit like this in more detail, where each of these black boxes is the grid cells from the rainfall runoff modeling element. And we first move from the cells to the yellow catchments and then we move through the yellow catchments to the sea. Additionally, in the water router, we can um, apply irrigation schemes, which are applied monthly, and we can also model retention of lakes through linear reservoir models. So that's the overview picture of the model, and how does it perform? How does it actually look? That's what we can see here, um, where we're looking at uh, verification plots, again, 1,700, WMO discharge um, measurements. And we can see, first of all, there's a bit of a difference in how many stations are available in different regions of the world when we look at the world geographically like this. Um, so we see we do see a high performance in Europe and North America because there are many more stations in these parts of the world. Something that's a little bit then more, more interesting to look at is that we see a discrepancy also within different regions of the world. So we can notice that there's differences in how the model performs in drier or areas where there are intensive water use. So there's still things we're working on and there's still questions that we're answering here. Um, but one of the main questions that we wanted to answer when looking at how the model performs is we wanted to evaluate its performance in data scarce areas. How can we be sure that the model captures uh, what's happening in areas without observations. To do that, we did the following analysis. So what you're looking at here are exceedance plots. Um, so ideally, if we had a perfect fit and the simulation matched the observations very well, we would see a quite sharp angle in this plot. So the red line is if we use uh, default parameters in our models, and the black line is using the parameterization method that I've already described. And we can see that when we move from default parameters to the model parameterization, that we increase the performance of the model. But in order to put this into context, we also then took six basins and calibrated them, and then also gauged the performance in this way. 
And what we can see is that we achieve quite a substantial gain using the model parameterization that we do. We, we, we come very close to what could be the best possible outcome in the calibration. So this gives us confidence that in ungauged catchments, the model does perform quite well. An example of how we've used the model in one of these ungauged catchments is in a data scarce area. Here we're looking at northern Kenya. So the DHI global hydrological model was used in this rapid water resources assessment to determine um, the viability of irrigation schemes in the area. And what was quite unique about this is that it, the project was very short, it had a two month timeline. Um, so what data was available, it was also about acquisition and transfer of knowledge and all of these things. Um, and it was quite remarkable then that by using the global hydrological model, the project could be, the what could be achieved within the short time frame of the project was, was quite remarkable. So we were able to assess the resources available in the area and apply climate change factors to see how the various schemes would fare in with various climate scenarios into the future. Another case of data scarcity um, includes transboundary basins, where rather than knowledge not being available, it comes it um, the scarcity comes from limitations in, in access to data. So here is a case in the Red River Basin, where a operational forecasting system was set up to show what water availability is coming in to the Vietnamese part of the basin from China. Um, this is because the, there's intensive water use in this part of the basin, but about 50% of the available water is coming from upstream. So here, a forecast of the expected inflow is, is very, very valuable to the Vietnamese part of the basin. What we're looking at here, we can see the, the grid cells of the rainfall runoff modeling, and then also each of these dots here then represents one of the grid cells in the model. So with that, I will summarize. Um, the main message from my talk, if, uh, just to drive it home one more time, is that global hydrological models can be an immensely valuable tool in data scarce areas, where they can be used for large scale climate change impacts assessments or large scale hydrological assessments. But we can also use them to investigate other hydrology driven processes. This could be pollution or mass transport. It could be floods or droughts. Um, so it's a, a good foundational tool for whatever you could dream of to use it for next. This global hydrological model that I presented here, DHI's global hydrological model, is an operational model. It's running every hour and giving short-term forecasts at an hourly level. Um, and it includes evaluations that give us confidence in ungauged catchments here so that we provide river discharge and also information about key hydrological parameters using this model. And um, with that, I think I can give it back over to Nicola thank to you. take it from here. Thank you very much, yeah. Alex. And thank you very much for, you know, for introducing us to this technology. It was, uh, it was really interesting to see the application that, um, that has been uh, done in these areas. And, um, I look forward to the to the discussion part at the end. So moving on now to the second presenter before we kick off the um, the debate. The second presenter is Dr. Laura Camus. She's a senior water resources expert, also DHI, and uh, she has ex ex extensive experience in hydrology, in earth observations, in the flood and drought early warning system, water resources management, the list is very long. Uh, I think the bottom line, she has been working in the past many years with uh, flood early warning systems. Uh, she's been actually driving the development uh, most recently in two uh, countries, in Tanzania and Thailand, of, uh, um, of these services being used by national authorities. And she will present one of these uh, two application cases uh, as a kind of a example of how flood early warning are being developed and used in these countries. Over to you, Laura. 
Thank you very much, Nicola. I will share my presentation. And while you are sharing that, Laura, just, just want to mention just a quick reminder, please, everyone, we see there are some comments already coming in. Please share your, your questions and, and, and reflections in, in the chat, wherever you're following this uh, webinar from. We'll be very happy to take them up at, after Laura's presentation. Sorry, Laura, over to you now. Thank you. So I will uh, present how uh, we are applying our knowledge of flood early warning systems in a specific case in Thailand. But actually, as Nicola has said, we are also developing and applying similar flood early warning systems in many other countries across the world, uh, including in Tanzania uh, and also many, yeah, many other places. So I start with uh, an overview of our operational systems for uh, flood forecasting. And then I will focus very much on the use of real-time data in these flood forecasting systems. So in Thailand, we have worked very closely with the Hydroinformatics Institute uh, since 2012. And we have developed over many years together with, uh, with HAI, we have developed decision support systems mostly for flood forecasting using uh, DHI's MIC operations technology and MIC modeling software. And also more recently using DHI's uh, water DSS web portal to be able to analyze and visualize the results. And we have developed uh, four different systems in Thailand, focusing on four key basins. And for all of these, we have developed these flood forecasting systems using uh, models, 1D and 2D models, and to uh, send early warnings for when there are floods coming. So flood forecasting systems, uh, these are all-in-one operational systems that we set up. So it starts on the left with getting real-time data. And really important for these systems is real-time rainfall data. And we also, of course, use uh, forecasted rainfall because we want to forecast floods. And we use uh, real-time water level data as well that's measured in these systems. And then we pre-process all of this data into catchment rainfall. We may do some bias correction where we compare, for example, satellite products with uh, measured rainfall station products. And we might bias correct the satellite product to use. And then we input these into hydrological models. Uh, in the case of Thailand, we use uh, Alex has talked about this now model. And then we also use uh, Mike Plus, uh, DHS mic modeling software for uh, hydrodynamic modeling with 1D and 2D models. So the real time rainfall, the forecast rainfall is input into the hydrological models, run through the hydrodynamic models. And then the output of this modeling is processed to look at what the forecasted water levels and discharge in the rivers are going to be over the next week. So we can then evaluate whether it looks like there will be a flood and we can generate alerts to tell people uh, to be prepared for floods that may be coming in the next uh, couple of days, hours or weeks. And the last part of the operational system is then that we publish all this information into a web portal. And we also have a system that we can send alerts via uh, WhatsApp, SMS, email to warn people. So this is an all-in-one operational system that we have established in Thailand and many other places. And it runs, uh, it's configured to run automatically every single day. So all of these processes operationally run daily. And therefore we need operators to also monitor the system and make sure that it continues to run. So publishing the results, uh, here I show you an example of the web interface. This is DHI's web portal for flood forecasting results. And you can see uh, in the middle, there is a map of the 2D flood area. This is around Bangkok in Thailand. And so you can see the 2D results. You can animate this over time to see how it changes. And on the left-hand side, you can see a series of locations with colors in red, green, and yellow. So here are where we are forecasting water levels and discharge in the river. And here it highlights where these 
uh, water levels or discharge where it crosses the threshold where, where there's a problem and there might be a flood. And we can also, on the right, we can look in graphs at 1D results, so at a particular location. We can plot the forecast water level or the discharge and look at where it crosses these, these critical thresholds, which indicate that there is a flood. So there's many things we can do in the web interface in terms of analysis and visualizing results. Uh, and this is one of the key tools in our operational system to make it easy for people to, to understand the outputs of the model. Also, we have uh, a dashboard component of our web interface. And this is where uh, the user can set up some, some key areas, which maybe flooding happens often in these areas. So it's really key focused flood areas that can be set up in specific dashboards and can then be shared between different users or uh, the public. And as I said, these are operational systems. So they run automatically every day. Automatically data is downloaded, uh, input to the models, the models are run, the results are shown in the web interface. All of this is configured to run every day. And so, of course, someone needs to monitor this to make sure all of these processes are running correctly. And this can be easily done in the, uh, in the web portal. So here there's a status board showing all the different jobs that are running. And uh, we also send out daily emails for operators to say whether every job has run successfully or if there is an error. And then the operator can go to the system and look at what the error is and uh, make changes. So we also try to make it very easy for operators to monitor all these automatic jobs that are running and very easy and quick to spot when there's an error. We talked about thresholds. So thresholds are a key part of the system to say when we send a warning or an alert for a flood. So our models are forecasting what the water level and the discharge is going to be. Uh, for the next week at specific locations. And then for each of these locations, we define a threshold. So we define a yellow threshold, which is, you know, there's a warning, there could be a problem here. And then a red threshold, which would be a, uh, an alert, a danger alert, that here the water level is forecast to be very high. And here uh, we would issue an alert that we uh, forecast a flood. And then finally, the, the key part of these operational systems is actually how can we use these systems to really impact uh, users and people to take actions when there is forecast a flood. So a key part of our system is that it also sends out uh, early warnings. So when the water level is forecast to go above these warning thresholds, then the system can automatically send out uh, flood warning messages. There's an option to do this via email. As you can see on the right, this is uh, an email that gets generated showing all of the red stations where there is forecast to be a flood, including information about the water level, the timing of the flood. Uh, this is all included in the alert. We can also send out early warnings via SMS. I know not everyone has access to email and smartphones, so we can send out warnings by SMS or text message and also by WhatsApp, which is also commonly used in many, in many countries. And we also have, as part of this system, uh, we can send out all these messages automatically when there is a threshold cross. But equally, we know that some users want to be able to manage uh, these alerts. So there is an option that a moderator uh, can approve the sending of these alerts. So the moderator would get the message that there's forecast to be a flood, they can go to the web portal and have a look at the results and the forecast. And uh, if they agree, then they can approve to send the messages. So there's lots of different options about uh, sending out these early warnings. But this is really the key part of, of the system because we send out these warnings and then the right people and the right organizations can then take actions on how to mitigate against damage from a forecasted flood. So that was an overview of our operational system.
And now I will talk uh, in a little more detail about how we use real-time data and how important it is in our flood forecasting system. Focusing on Thailand again, uh, but of course this applies to all of our systems. So using data in these operational systems, on uh, this dashed line down the middle, this would be a time of forecast. So this is when we run the models and we make the forecast for the next week. On the left-hand side, this is where real-time data is extremely important. So for the inputs of the models, this is where we could use. Uh, in Thailand, they have many stations which are measuring rainfall, and these are with a telemetry server. So as soon as there is measured rainfall, the data gets put on a telemetry server, and the system, our system, can then read it immediately. So we get this measured data uh, in real time. And this is actually in the Thailand system. This is what is used uh, to give you the current rainfall that we input to the models. In other areas where there isn't telemetry stations that can provide this real-time data, uh, for example, in our system we set up in uh, Tanzania, we are currently using some real-time satellite rainfall data using GPM rainfall. So there are also global data products that we can use to give the current uh, real-time rainfall data. Another source that we use actually in Thailand is radar data. This can be very useful. Uh, it's available in real time and it's at higher resolution than satellite data. And it can give a better spatial coverage than using the gauge stations, which are just for one point location. So this real, real time rainfall data is extremely important to input into our system to give the current situation of what's happening uh, on the ground in terms of rainfall. We also use uh, real-time data from aging stations with water levels and flows. And I will talk about this a bit more later and how we use this data. And then of course, up until today, we have all this real-time data, but we also need the forecast rainfall to be able to produce a flood forecast for the next week. So for forecast rainfall in the Thailand system, we use uh, this weather rainfall forecast model, which is something that in Thailand, they have taken uh, a global data set and then they have refined it uh, specifically for Thailand. So this is uh, a specifically Thailand data set and it's for the next seven days. In other systems, we can also use other global forecast products, for example, uh, GFS forecast rainfall. And this can also be available for a longer time period. So for example, the next two weeks. And then we run our, our model simulation. So we have what we call the hindcast, which is what has happened in the last 10 days where we're using this real-time data. And then the forecast of what will happen in the next week or two weeks using the forecast rainfall. And in the Thailand system, we launch these model simulations. We run this every single day. And actually in the rainy season, if there's heavy rainfall, then the operators in Thailand can actually run this more regularly. So every four hours, for example, uh, because the rainfall that they get from the telemetry station is available every hour. So they can actually run this uh, more often. So to talk a little bit about how this real-time rainfall data is used and how it can impact forecast effectiveness. Here, there's a diagram of uh, a hydrological catchment with a river running through it. And it's split into three areas, A, B, and C. So on the left, if we're just looking at area A, this part of the hydrological catchment, it's relatively quite small. So the river, the point A, will peak, there will be a flood peak uh, very quickly after rainfall happens in the basin. So in this instance, we need to rely on the forecast rainfall, to so forecast rainfall for the next week, for example. And forecast rainfall, the reliability may be poor compared to uh, using measured uh, real-time rainfall. At point B, this is further down the river. So here we have a moderate lean, uh, lead time, meaning that the travel time of the water from when it rains in the upper catchment in A, it takes a longer time to travel down to this point at B. So actually at this point, uh, what the system will be looking at is 
the real-time rainfall that was measured up in catchment A. And that can actually be used to forecast the floods that might happen in catchment B at that point there. So sometimes we call this uh, a now cast because we're using measured rainfall to forecast the flood rather than forecast rainfall because it takes a long time to travel from A to B. So here often the reliability is better because we are basing our flood forecast on this measured rainfall rather than forecasted rainfall. But of course, we also will use forecasted rainfall to extend the, the time of the forecast into the next week, for example. And then finally, at the bottom of the catchment, here there's a very long lead time from the rainfall that happened up at the top in A all the way down uh, to what might be a city down at C. So there's a long travel time from the catchment. So actually the flood forecast here uh, will be using again this measured rainfall that we saw in uh, the upper catchment. And then we can also start to think about using real-time data uh, in data assimilation to improve our forecast. And I will explain this in the next slide. But using this measured rainfall to give the flood forecast and including data assimilation means that the reliability of the flood forecast can be very high when you have these larger catchments and the rain has happened up at the top. So data assimilation, I mentioned, this is a uh, extremely good use of real-time data that can be used to improve the reliability of the forecast. So here, what we're actually using instead of rainfall now, we're looking at real-time data of water levels in the river. So this we use uh, to actually correct what the model has been doing over the last uh, 10 days. So we can see in the red dot, this would be the water level that we observe in the river. And the blue line is the water level that was simulated in the model over the past uh, week. So we can see there's a difference. And we can see that if uh, we continue with our model simulation and we don't correct it into the forecast period on the right, then our forecast becomes more unreliable because we're starting from a point that's not what's observed. So what we do in our system is we actually correct the model results uh, for the hindcast, what's happened in the past week. We correct them to match the observed values so that our forecast is starting from the correct or observed water level. And we do this automatically. So we take the real-time water level data, we input it to the system, we make the correction, and we run the model to give the forecast water level. So this is where using real-time data of observed water levels can really improve uh, flood forecasts. We can also collect real-time data in terms of continuously collecting these observations of water level and our forecasted water level. And we can make comparisons every day. So we automatically take the data, make a comparison, and where there are differences, then we can calculate performance statistics or goodness of fit statistics. And so here, then we can give the user, when we make a flood forecast, we can give an indication of the uncertainty of the forecast based on these performance statistics. And I also just wanted to mention in, uh, in many of our systems, as well as using uh, deterministic forecasts, we can also use probabilistic forecasting. So this is where there's many different forecasts of the rainfall. Each one is assigned a probability. And here then we can have a range of what the forecast water levels might be for the next week. And this kind of range can capture the uncertainty in forecast. So here in the graph, you can see that the, uh, the, the blue range, this is the range of the probabilistic forecasting. And we would expect our forecast to fall within this range. If this range is very wide, then there's a higher uncertainty in our forecast. And if it's narrow, there's a lower uncertainty. So here we can forecast into the future uh, a bit longer, but also where it becomes more uncertain, but also provides this range of uncertainty. So to summarize, uh, our operational systems for flood forecasting, they run regularly. 
So most of our systems run every single day, uh, sometimes every four hours, but they're running regularly and they must run regularly to give uh, reliable flood forecasts. And so in order to run uh, every single day, then they need to use the latest available data. And this needs to be in real time. So this needs to be from that day uh, as close to real time as possible to give a good forecast. So for example, our systems use observed or measured rainfall data from telemetry stations, from radar, from satellite products. And we input these to our hydrological models. And these are really important. Then we also have the forecast rainfall input. And again, we want to take the latest forecast. So we want to take the forecast from today to use in our hydrological models. We can also use uh, real-time measured water level data in data assimilation to correct our, our hindcast and then improve our forecast. And we can also collect these real-time observations, compare them against our forecast and use this to understand uncertainty. So really, in summary, what I'm saying is real-time data is very important for our operational flood forecasting systems. And it enables us to produce reliable forecasts, which can then allow us to send out warnings so that people can mitigate against the impact of an oncoming flood. So thank you very much. And uh, I will pass back to Nicola. Thank you very much, Laura. For this presentation, it was very insightful to see actually how this uh, kind of technology has been used uh, in the case of Thailand. And I think you raised a lot of very good points around, uh, you know, communication and uh, the use also of um, data simulation. So we are now been through a little bit the, the topics that we had for today. And I think this is a very good start for the, uh, for the discussion. So I would like once again to invite all of you that are watching, that are with us today, uh, no matter the platform that you're in, please share your, your comments, uh, questions for the expert in the chat box. And we will be very happy to take this up to the expert. When you're doing so, please share also your, your name, organization that you're from, maybe also the country, since uh, we, have, uh, we often have uh, participants uh, that are our audience that is from from very different countries and part of the world. So please share this information. And of course, also share who the question is for. So we can, uh, we can address and make sure we, you get the answer you're looking for. While questions keep coming in, I would like to start and I'll start the, addressing the first question to Alex. Um, and I think one of the, I would say one of the key messages that came out from your, from your presentation was around the use of global hydrologic model models uh, in data scars areas. And I think uh, it was really interesting to see this analysis that you have done in these areas on the performance of the model. I must say it was also quite, I would say impressive, uh, at least it looked like that from, uh, from what you describe. And so I would like to hear if you could elaborate a little bit more around the effort that it took to get these results in the area where you did this model analysis. And if you, did you use any on the ground data or you just rely on, on global data sets and how do you, can this be replicated everywhere? I mean, I cheated a little bit, it's three questions in one, but I think you got <laughs> a little bit of what, I, what I'm asking here. Yeah, I, I think I got the gist of, of the question. Thanks, Nicola. Um, so in these, in these three basins, uh, sorry, six basins where, where we evaluated whether the parameterization that we used was a substantial increase over the default as compared to what the calibration looked like. Um, here we did have observed data. This was how we could compare what the parameterization looked like compared to the observations. And we had quite a lot of data so that we could go in and look at what's happening within the basin and not just at the the results end of the basin as, as the river moves to the sea. So we could see what's happening throughout the basin and see the performance, not just for large flows, but also for small flows at the, the upper parts of the catchment. So we picked these places because they had a lot of data where we could then make the analysis that we wanted to do. Um, it, it, the whole point of having the data scarce 
area theme is that then we can use it for ungauged catchments where this calibration wouldn't be possible, um, which also means that the performance evaluation in those areas wouldn't be possible. So we did put quite a lot of work into this analysis to be as confident as we could that when we then transition to places without uh, data where we could check the performance that we can have have a reliable information that comes out of the model. Um, if, if that answers your question, Nicola. Yeah, thank you very much, Alex. It, it did, and I think it's, yeah. it's uh, you know it's quite clear how you then you know use this information in other areas. I think it was a very good clarification. Maybe before before we move on to a question for Laura, I just maybe want to link a little bit up because one of the topic Laura kept on bringing up in her presentation is around data simulations and she showed a uh, different um, type of information that can be used uh, for data simulation depending on, on what is available, what you would like to achieve. And so I would like to hear a little bit if you could, I think you touched a little bit upon your presentation, but elaborate a little bit more around the data simulation as part of the GHM workflow, if we can call it. So when you use a GHM in this context, how important is data simulation and which type of the products that also Laura was talking about are actually being used in, in your case? Um, that, that's a good point. I don't think I mentioned data assimilation in my presentation on the GHM at all because it is something new that we are embarking on. Um, how we can use global scale data sets to assimilate um, different aspects of the hydrological models at, as, as we move along. So we've been doing some experiments with soil moisture information from satellites and then also with gravimetric information from, from satellites to see how we can use this information to, to correct the, um, the rainfall runoff models as we move along. So as, as Laura described very, very succinctly in, in her talk, that we can make sure that the forecasts that we create are starting from the best possible information that we have in the moment. Thank you, Alex. I mean, it sounds like yeah. a, it was uh, just like spot on. Then <laughs> he did yeah. one of the one of the new areas that you're actually looking at. So I think this is quite interesting, and I mean, I think links quite well also to what Laura was discussing. I mean, it's quite clear in the case um, in the in the system that she's been working with, uh, data simulation played quite a big quite a big role. Over to you, Laura. I have a question coming in, which is around uh, the use. Actually, I think probably refers a little bit to, I think you were quite uh, um, vocal in your presentation around the importance of this interface, visualization. Uh, I think you touched quite a lot on those more than the, uh, in a way also the technology behind. And I was a little bit wondering how I understand communication is an important part of early warning systems. How have you addressed that? So how have you, you know, which stakeholders have you been engaging with? How have you been basically coming up with some of these visualization tools that uh, you have presented? Yeah, thank you. It's a very good question. Uh, I think actually I will use a use case from uh, our Tanzania project where we have implemented a very similar flood forecasting system. And so here uh, in this project, we have like Nicola, like you just said, we have this web interface where of course people can go and look at the results and when we were developing this interface, uh, we took some input from, from different uh, people that like to an analyze these kind of things um, to, to, to find out what they want to see in the web interface. But actually here, I think the key thing I wanted to say in response to your question was to do with the stakeholders about disseminating the information. Because really, it's mostly the operators of the system that look at the maps and the plots uh, the people that have the very technical knowledge about uh, analyzing exactly what is happening in the system. But actually the, the key end users are the people that receive these flood forecasts. And uh, in our Tanzania system, we have worked very closely with, um, we're working with the Ministry of Water, but there's also a disaster management department that are actually responsible for um, all the mitigation actions and for issuing, for example, evacuation instructions. And I think uh, the, the key part of our system is we, we don't actually issue evacuation instructions, right? 
So that the system is issuing warnings to say that we have models that we think there's going to be a flood. But actually then we say uh, it's very much the responsibility of, of these key uh, stakeholders, which might be government organization or departments that are uh, mandated and responsible for issuing these kind of orders. It is then, uh, they can of course look at our flood warnings and then uh, they would then decide whether to issue these kind of evacuation orders or mitigating actions. So our system is very much, uh, the warnings are to inform uh, that we think there will be a flood, but then we work very closely with, uh, with many stakeholders, depending on the country, uh, depending who's responsible for, for issuing different instructions. Uh, we must work very closely with, uh, with these departments so that they can use the, the warnings from our system to make the appropriate uh, actions and instructions to, to different people. Um, what's I going to say? Yeah, thank you very much, Laura. It was it was actually very interesting to, to hear a little bit how you're working with these authorities and basically tapping into the governance uh, of these issues uh, at the local level. One question that came in is, uh, I think, more around the communities. So not so much the institutions, but rather the local communities. And I'm, I'm yeah. reading it. So obviously, early warnings are usually relevant for communities around the world. I think we have, uh, um, we can all agree on this. Uh, how do you make sure that the relevant communities get the warnings? And I think you have already addressed a little bit around the um, authorities. So how about at the community level? Does messages get sent to everyone living in the area or how is it in thailand everyone in bangkok gets a message from from you or <laughs> so in uh it very much depends on the on the country and how uh the um how the, the government and the people doing the warnings the stakeholders it very much depends uh it's different in every country so in thailand uh hi the, the institute we work with they produce the flood warnings and I, this is actually then used to inform government departments who then pass on the messages to the communities. In, uh, in Tanzania, for example, it's the department, um, uh, disaster management department that would issue the instructions. But actually we've been uh, talking with them. And so when we, when we set up in the system, we can be very specific about who actually gets the messages on their phone, for example. And so we, we actually don't decide this on our own. We work very closely with the right department and we uh, work together to decide who should get these messages and to make sure that they're informed that they will get these messages. So in Tanzania, we actually uh, visited with, with some department representatives. We visited different flood villages where we're forecasting and we spoke to them and we asked them who should get this information. And we worked closely with the, the government, local government officials to understand this. And then we collect phone numbers uh, and this is input into our operational system so that uh, specific people that have been mandated by, by local government departments to get these messages, then actually get uh, in the different villages and communities, then they will get either an SMS or a WhatsApp or an email, depending on their preference, depending on what phone they have. Um, but it's very much, we don't just send it to everybody. This would be, uh, I think, alarming and not through the correct channels. So it's very important that we work closely with uh, the government departments all the way down to the local community level to find the right person who understands what the system is doing and can then receive the message and, and take the appropriate action. So that's, yeah, that's how we do it, work closely with, uh, with the right stakeholders. Thank you very much, Laura. It was very interesting, actually. Since I have quite a few insights on that, and I, I it's, it's quite interesting during actually the last um, event uh, here organized by DFC. Actually, we uh, this engagement and in involvement in communication to the community was actually one of the think questions that came up uh, quite a lot. One of the topic of discussion. So I think it was, uh, you know, it sounds like there has been quite a quite some thoughts put into making sure uh, to use this information in the right way and they reach um, all the relevant people. I would actually maybe bridge a little bit toward Alex with this question. And I'm, um, I know your presentation was quite focused on the technology. Uh, you had a little bit of a reference to WMO uh, and their effort in collecting inputs from different global biologic models. So I would like to hear, um, have you also encountered this 
issue of communication uh, of the results. Are these results being used in a similar way like in Thailand uh, for um, early warning system or is it at the stage where you know you're rather working on the technology so it's not that interface is not maybe as advanced as the example that Laura brought? Mm. This, this question I think has a couple of different facets and I think the, the first one is that the technology of the global hydrological model as I presented it here is kind of a foundational um, starting point to working to build a system such as the one that, that Laura presented in her talk in, in her case. Um, and so what can often happen is you can use a global hydrological model as, as the starting point to create a system that on top of it has these communication aspects and the stakeholder engagement um, through specific projects. So for example, this was what was done in the case I presented in the, in the Red River Basin as well. Um, the global hydrological model was the start. And then afterwards, these, these questions of dissemination have been um, going through specific project-based um, applications. So as it is, there is not a, a risk management system um, set up at a global scale. Um, although, if I come to think about it, we are actually forecasting um, seasonal plastic load. Um, so we're using the global hydrological model to present a risk in at a global level um, in a specific case then. Um, and this is feeding into to a global analysis in this way. Um, but often often the dissemination is project-based. It's project-based. And one, uh, I think this sounds very good and I think links a little bit up to um, one of the comments that I actually want to bring up next, which is around the um, you know, early warning for all initiative. Um, this is an initiative that's been uh, recently la launched by the United Nations. Um, to ensure that every person on Earth has a safeguard is safeguarded by early warning system by 2027, and do I hear Alex? That's is this part of that effort? The the work you're doing, connection with WMO, is it is it maybe is feeding into it, or is uh, a building block towards something that the the United Nations is putting together? Or what what are your thoughts here? Um, we are not uh, directly involved in the initiative as such. Um, but I see that there could be really, really fantastic link-ups between, between these two. Water for all, or this, this initiative for all, um, that's exactly one of the reasons why we wanted to develop this global hydrological model, where we can be sure that data scarce areas are not left behind. Um, so there's quite, quite a good link there. Um, which could be explored. The, the WMO report is an initial look at the state of water resources all over the globe, including areas that have not been gauged before. Um, and, and so this is a good step in that direction as well. And we're, we're really happy to be involved in that effort and to see what comes out of it as, as it moves forward and, and the analysis becomes even more in depth. Sounds exciting. Sounds also like we should stay tuned on uh, how this is uh, okay. is going to be. It, it looked a little bit like also when you share the stories around how the technology developed in over the last uh, 20, 30 years. Sounds really like there is, you know, south, something building up to some, you know, really exploding the potential of this uh, of this new uh, technology. There are um, quite a few comments actually coming in. So just switching a little bit topic, there are quite a few comments coming in and I'm just sharing a little bit. I think there are, you know, we're of course super happy to hear uh, that they're positive and, and there's been several that has also thanked around the, uh, you know, the topic, how it's been presenting, the, the uh, what has been emphasized during the presentation. There are several participants from different countries, Indonesia, Zambia, uh, and I would like to, of course, thank everyone and, of course, also share these, these uh, positive feedback with the presenters, with the experts that, that, are, that are contributing to this. Uh, the next question is actually, I would like to address it to start with at least with Laura. Uh, I could see we, we're going to switch also, ask you, Alex, as well afterward. Well, we're going to start with Laura and I'm going to try to put together a few comments because they are all around um, the topic of um, sorry, I'm just just finding 
uh, all the different pieces. So they are all around the, the topic of um, uh, how these technologies can be used in different contexts. So uh, you Laura presented very well the use in, in, in Thailand uh, of such a, I guess it's almost national level early warning system. You talk a little about Tanzania, you said there were several things on the way. So I would like to hear a little bit if you collaborate how these um, how can these technologies be rolled out? What is the effort? What is being done already? Uh, how do you see maybe this rollout can be uh, speed up or how can it be done in a more efficient way? And one last comment, and I'm sorry, I'm just really trying to bridge here and putting a little bit on the, stop light, on the spotlight. So there's also a bit of a reference to Ethiopia. And I was wondering if, is, is that an era where you or some of the colleagues are already working with? Um, yep, there was a lot of, Things. I hope it. Uh, I hope it made sense. Yeah. Thank you, Nicola. I think uh, it's a very good question about uh, how can we apply these technologies uh, more widely in many places. Uh, the systems I presented, uh, we apply these um, these systems at DHI. We apply them in many projects all over the world, actually. And I think the the key area for these systems um, is about data, really. So we've talked about data scarce areas. Uh, we've talked about uh, having all this real-time data. And I think um, the, the, the example I presented in Thailand, this example is where we have a system where actually there's a lot of real-time data available. So here we can do data assimilation because we have real-time water levels. We have the real-time telemetry server rainfall data. Uh, so here, actually, we have a lot of data available, and it's available in real time. So it's a very nice application of the system. But we also work in many areas where uh, there's much more data scarcity, and there isn't this real-time information that's available immediately. So I think uh, when we, if you like, roll out these systems to, to other countries, to other places, uh, at other different spatial scales. This is all very possible in terms of the tools. So in terms of the models, in terms of the operational system we set up, the web interface, these are all transferable to anywhere in the world, actually. Uh, and, we, and we do do this as part of projects. And I think the key area here then, because all of the technology is transferable, the key area is what we input into the system. And this is, this is the data. So what we've seen uh, when we apply these systems in data scarce areas, we actually uh, can still produce uh, reliable flood forecasts because more recently we've been able to use um, Earth observation products. So these global satellite products of um, measured rainfall or forecasted rainfall, and these are global products. So we can use these anywhere in the world to produce these flood forecasts. We also need data to calibrate our models um, but of course, we can also, when, when there's not much data available, we do the best we can. We can still set up a model and we can still forecast flooding. So uh, I think really the, the, the message here is that this technology is very transferable to anywhere in the world. And we can use it in uh, data scarce areas, in areas where there's lots of data. And the amount of data available impacts the reliability of the results. Uh, but of course, we can still produce these results. And I think when when you're thinking about um, instigating a new project in a new area, uh, it's also worth it's worth thinking about. We would like to set up the system. This would be great to have this technology. At the same time, let's think about what data is available and do we need uh, maybe another project to look at our rainfall stations, to look at our gauging stations, to make sure we're getting some data. And this is a bit more automated or uh, good quality data. So I think these two things come, come hand in hand with impacting the reliability of the forecast. Uh, but as I said, we can apply this and produce forecasts uh, anywhere in the world. Um, yeah, but having good data is, uh, is, uh, would be very nice <laughs> to improve the reliability of the forecast. So well, something to think about. Yeah, we hear, uh, we hear your wish, up, Laura. <laughs> it's my wish. It is my yeah. wish. It's true. Good data. Um, good data under the Christmas to... tree. Sorry? Good data under the Christmas tree. That's your, yeah, that's right? your dream. Uh, my <laughs> maybe actually using uh, taking this uh, the, the, this remark, Laura, that you just made, and 
maybe I, I want to, I would like to address a comment to Alex, uh, which is exactly around, Laura was mentioning around relying on weather forecast in certain areas. And one of the concerns that came in, and this is from, um, from the audience, a uh, uh, colleague called Marita, she's uh, um, bringing up the topic of one of the challenges is unpredictable, unpredictable weather forecasting. And uh, even governors are caught unaware. And so I'm just going to ask you, I know this is a big topic, but I don't know, uh, how, how are you addressing this? Are you, um, you know, is, is this really an area of concern and, and how are you mitigating this uh, potential risk? Yes, I mean, the reliability of a forecast is, is the one of the goals or, or one of the essential elements of, of what you get out of a model, what you put into it dictates what, what you get out. Um, and one of the ways that we can increase the reliability of a forecast is by, instead of taking a global forecast, we can start with our, our um, characterization of the world and we can use local weather products instead of global weather products, which are generally produced um, at a, a finer resolution. So sometimes small local events can be captured in, in these weather forecasts that wouldn't be um, captured at the global scale. Um, we can also then see a difference in, in patterns of a well-performing global data product um, in general performs well over the world, but may not perform well in a specific area of specific interest for a specific community. Um, so here we can make uh, local models. So this is one of the focuses that we've had in the past year is developing an algorithm to make local models from the global model, which use the characteristics set out by this parameterization, but where we can then update the, the meteorological forcing components in the model to then produce um, different, more localized results afterwards. And we can demonstrate in a couple of different places that where we've we've tried this, one of them being being Denmark, that we can see a really substantial increase in in the performance of the results this way. Thank you, Alex. And time is running. We, there are actually several questions that I, I don't think we'll be able to address them. Uh, they're super relevant, but I think it will be uh, we we're gonna do our best to uh, address them afterward offline. Um, and, but I would like to wrap up a little bit and uh, I'll do that warming a little bit up toward COP28, which as you, uh, most of you are aware of, is going to be in a few weeks in Dubai. And uh, it will be, COP28 will be the forum where um, United Nations governments will be discussing how to limit and prepare for future climate change. Um, so, and I see this topic is, is very closely linked to what we've been discussing today, to the issue of flooding, early warning, being prepared. And I would like to start with Laura. Uh, I'll ask this question to both of you, but I would like to start with Laura and hear a little bit, how do you see some of the technologies that we've been discussing today as a way to ad adapt to climate change, to address uh, loss and damage, which is one of the key topics that has been brought up during COP27 uh, and, and will be also during COP28. And um, yeah, any lesson learned, anything you can share from your experience, and maybe also to uh, to conclude, also if you could, if you could, if you have any plea for the global political uh, level that we'll be meeting uh, during this event, as from your side as an expert. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, I mean what we've seen and what we're told also by many of the people that work in the the places that we are working. You know, we're told by people who are farming, by people who are living in cities all over the world, we're told that they've seen that their climate has changed. They've noticed it. It's not just models predicting change. They've, they've actually experienced it and they've seen it. And they struggle to rely on the rainfall patterns that they once understood and once knew as a, uh, would expect to happen. So we've seen that the rainy season in many countries starts earlier or starts later. We've seen that uh, rainfall events uh, can be heavier than has been seen before or more frequent than has been seen before. And so I think uh, talking about flood early warning systems anyway, um, these systems, because they're using measured rainfall and forecast rainfall, then of course they're using the rainfall that we see on the ground to forecast a flood. 
and uh, in that way they're I suppose accounting for climate change and that we're using these these measured rainfalls that are different to what we expect and forecasting a flood that might uh, that we think is going to happen that in the past people wouldn't expect to happen because they don't expect there to be heavy rainfall in this season or this early. So I think uh, these kind of flood forecasting systems can provide a very fast alert to people um, about um, you know a disaster that might be happening and then people can take the appropriate responses to evacuate, for example, or prepare for a, an unexpected flood that might be uh, heavier than expected uh, or more often than expected from people's previous experiences um, because of climate change. Um, yeah, and you asked about a, a message. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, I think we really need to accept that people across the world are, are really seeing the changes and that it's not just something we can uh, say we're modeling, it's going to change. It's changing now. It's already changed and people can see it changing. So we have no time to waste really in uh, in implementing systems such as this uh, to be able to help people to respond to disasters that are bigger or more frequent than, than they were before. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lauren. I think, I mean, right there, you, you really nailed one of... You know, as I said, we couldn't really cover all the points, but it was one of the comments that, you know, that was actually going toward this, a lot toward this direction, uh, serving the grassroots, serving the, uh, really the uh, population at the local level, ensuring this technology can do that. And finally, um, I would like to ask Alex, if you could be very, very brief, just a few thoughts. I don't know if you have any reflection, anything to add to what Laura already said, especially considering that the technology you're working with is actually a global technology. And I could see is really, you know, a big role to play uh, in this uh, in this forum. Yeah, uh, one one of the aspects about global hydrological models in in this space as relates to climate change, hydrological models have been used in a, in a way to evaluate what patterns will emerge um, in in the new climate space. So it isn't just about weather patterns changing, then we can take it one step further and use global models to evaluate and predict what will be the outcome of various climate change scenarios across the globe. So we can look at hydrology not as basin specific, but as something that affects the entire planet in, in one comprehensive way. Um, so this is one way in which the technology can be used um, rather than not at a local level, but at a at at, at the global rather um, comprehensive level. And, and this then, if I should also come with a message, my message is that what we do here, looking at modeling and, and systems and operational awareness and real-time data and disaster risk management, this is all mitigation of the symptoms of climate change. And, Technology is going to help these symptoms, but it's not going to change the, the problem. What we need is, is action in, in this regard and not, not a, a belief that technology will save us. We're doing what we can um, with these sorts of technologies, but the ideal scenario would, would be that we don't need them, right? Um, so that would be my message, my message to, to the COP. Thank you very much, Alex. I think that was a great way to a great message to end the debate. So what I will do now is thank, of course, everyone. Thanks to the expert and give uh, words back to Arvid for the closing remarks. Over to you, Arvid. Thank you, Nicola. First of all, thank you so much to the three speakers and to all of you uh, attending online. Special thanks go to our uh, facilitator, Nicola, indeed. Job well done. Um, today we have learned from um, different flood warning cases. Indeed, highly interesting. We hope that you'll share this knowledge and uh, the lessons learned within your organization. And in uh, this regard, I'm happy to inform you that the webinar is recorded and it will be made available at DFC's homepage and also on our social media, LinkedIn, um, YouTube and Facebook and Twitter X. 
in case you should like to recommend others to view this webinar later. We will also announce coming uh, events on our uh, social media platforms, so please sign up and uh, follow us. This is all what we have time for today. Thanks for spending part of your day with us. Goodbye from us here at the Nita Fellowship Center.